Wow, fantastic, unbelievable. Um, uh, thank you so much, Danny and Sarah. Thank you, Tatanka. We were at some point gonna break into a circle, but I think people are probably comfortable and settled in. And I, I wanna let you know, we're still on Zoom. We're still broadcasting out to the world here. Uh, we uh, three hours worth. And uh, 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 Jan, I wanna thank you again for your fundraising efforts. Anybody online who wants to donate to GREEP, uh, we're at solartopia at gmail. Just write me. And the, uh, the um, nonprofit is uh, the CICJ out of Columbus, Ohio. So we're going to keep going. Um, uh, Lily uh, 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 um, Hayden, uh, Lily Hayden, thanks for being here. Thank you for staying. It's wonderful. We want you to come play for us again, if you will. You're magnificent. Unbelievable. So I want, and I, I want to talk to you about Beethoven. Okay. So please, I'll call you. Mimi is still here. If we can do, um, uh, 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 can you come on up, Julie? Uh, we're gonna do Julie and and uh, and, and Levy and um, uh, John Brakey and then Leno. Okay, is that good? Oh, and Peter Matthews, you're still here too. So you will be on the Zoom. So we have five, and then anyone else who wants to join us uh, can speak. Uh, it, this is a magnificent group of people. I know it looks like a small group, but this is ev anything that any organizer could ever dream of. This is the group that we really want to have. And this is one of the great organizers here, Julie. Uh, I call her the Queen of Topanga. I know it's, uh, it, uh, it's embarrassing to her, but she does have a crown, as you can see. So it's going to be Julie, and then Levy uh, of Nuclear Hot Seat, then John Brakey, uh, then Peter Matthews, and then, uh, and then Leno. Okay? Are we good? Okay. I, I'm going to try to be brief. Okay. You don't have to. Okay, thanks. But just All right. make your point. I want to I, I want to share just as a prelude to this because of the very important presentation we just listened to that I am an environmentalist but sadly an inconvenient truth is also the fact that microwave radiation is not safe for us and for the planet so we have to be careful when we're looking for environmental solutions and that's why I loved what you proposed because it was voluntary and people like me who are sick unfortunately don't have a lot of choice um, smart chips can be difficult for us um, but I totally support your goals. That having been said, what I want to share is that um, microwave radiation is a real problem. We just won a major lawsuit against the FCC. In the lawsuit, the judge said that the FCC was arbitrary and capricious in ignoring the clear evidence of harm, particularly to children. And I know none of us want to harm children. Okay, that's real. I know you don't want to look at that, some people, because I found that as a progressive Democrat, well, actually left of a progressive Democrat, that oftentimes when I try to speak about this, people just shut down. They do not want to hear this. And I think it's really important that we hear this because we have to, as Mimi and others have been sharing, unite all of us and be sensitive to all of our needs and all of our concerns. So what I wanted to share is that here in Los Angeles County, they are posed to pass the worst ordinance that I have ever seen regarding wireless um, facilities. What they are saying here in Los Angeles County, by the way, the bill was written by the telecom. What they are saying is that we have no protection whatsoever. There is a denial of health, and some of that comes out of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which says you cannot challenge the rollout of any of this infrastructure based on the environment which the courts have taken to mean human health, among other things. And I think that's problematic because this is not good for the environment. We have studies on jaguars. We have studies on bees. I do believe glyphosates cause tremendous harm to bees, but so does wireless radiation, causes them to become confused, to go in circles, to die, etc. And it's also harmful to human beings. And we need to look at this as we move forward. Many um, jurisdictions in California have passed very protective ordinances including Encinitas, Petaluma, I, I'm not, Elk, Elk Grove, I could go on and on. But in these ordinances, at a minimum, they protect you from having a small cell tower, which is 100 times or more, more radiating than 4G, which has never been tested. We've only tested through 3G, and we've shown in our own National Toxicology Program of the National Institute of Health, clear evidence of harm, including cancers, particularly cancers in our nerves around our organs, like shawarma in the ear and like brain tumors. But the courts conveniently have not allowed any of the brain tumor cases to get to discovery where they have to produce the evidence of harm. And we all know what corporations do, and that's why Harvey Wasserman, who's one of my greatest friends in the world, 
gets that this is a real issue because he saw it with the nuclear power industry and it's the same thing all over again. All I'm asking here today, I'm not asking you to join our group. I'm not a right-wing conspiracy theorist. I could continue to be very committed to you know all of the things we work for here. But what I'm asking for you is your help in stopping this ordinance. It has just passed the Department of Regional Planning, the LA County Department of Regional Planning. In the hearing, we all spoke out. We had scientists, engineers, doctors. We all spoke out about the harm. We all spoke out about the ordinance that are protective. For example, let's not have a small cell tower within 500 feet of our homes. Let's not allow them to put them on our private property and not tell us they're saying it's ministerial, meaning it is a um, essential infrastructure, and therefore they do not have to tell us. For example, I have been asking under freedom of information for two years around what is planned in my community, and they have refused to share it with me. Finally, they sent me a list of poll upgrades. Have you seen poll upgrades in your neighborhoods? Yeah. I bet you have. Well, those and the electricity moving from four volts to 16,000 volts is all the prelude and the, the micro trenching in the roads. All of it is a prelude to 5G, to small cells, which they plant every 200 to 500 feet, not just here, but across the globe. And when you go to countries like Sweden, I'm part of um, Safe Tech International, which was formerly Stop 5G International. But we understand this is about safe technology. Safe, by the way, fiber optic is safer, it's faster, it's more efficient. We pay trillions of dollars in our tax dollars for it. I asked you to look at the irregulators lawsuit, and yet they found it cheaper to unroll it wirelessly, which is less secure and more harmful. So this ordinance is about to get rubber stamped. We don't know when, but in early June by the Board of Supervisors. And, and I think this will be of concern to other environmentalists, on April 5th, there's gonna be a hearing that is going to declare a negative declaration so that these infrastructure does not have to go through NEPA or CEQA. That is a problem for anybody who has an environmental concern. So we're trying to fight this. And we have um, L. Scott McCullough, who I believe is the top attorney in the country working with us. We're also working with Julian Gresser, an attorney in Santa Barbara. And mostly what we need is a lot of grassroots participation. We need people to get on the Zoom call for the hearing on April 5th. And we need people when this goes before the Board of Supervisors to do the same thing. Because that is going to be an important prelude to the lawsuit, which unfortunately we feel is going to have to happen. Because a lot of the supervisors are taking the money from the telecom. What a shock. So that's really all I want to say today. I do have um, a piece of paper I'm going to pass around for your email addresses. That's what I mostly need. Don't worry so much about the rest. Your name and your email address. I will put you on my list so that you will receive notification about the hearings. Also about fire and safety. We can't talk that much about health because of the Telecom Act. We can talk about fire. We have a lot of evidence of harm from fire departments. By the way, fire departments don't get this because they were getting cancer. So they were able to get immunity. That should tell you something right there. So I'm gonna pass this around. I hope people will sign up and feel free to ask me to take you off my list right after this. I do so within one day. I maintain my own list. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, there's the model of a great activist. Thank you so much. Julie has just been astounding in, on this issue. Mila Reason, you're also on the speaker list. Mila, at, at, at some point, um, if you'll come up. Uh, Amibi Halevi. Uh, we, we're going to segue straight from 5G into nuclear power. Levy was actually at Three Mile Island when it went off. And she runs a magnificent uh, podcast here in L.A. Levy, if you'll come on up. Uh, we've known each other quite a long time. And she's a great... And tell people how to get on your podcast list. Okay, we'll start with the essentials first. Nuclearhotseat.com. Show is called Nuclear Hot Seat. We are completing our 11th year of weekly podcasts. There are 561 of them right now, and 562 posts on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week coming up. I cover all aspects of the nuclear issue, with the focus being on what happens on the ground, what happens to people, what happens to communities, how are people fighting back, what can we do to keep each other in good heart, and what can we do to coordinate our actions between communities. Because one of the things the nuclear industry takes advantage of is that when a nuclear problem comes up, be it an undiscovered waste dump, 
or policy to try and get a small modular nuclear reactor, which the nuclear industry calls a small modular reactor because they don't want the N word in there. Um, small modular nuclear reactor cited. There are, there's such a wide range of issues that get covered. But what I want to talk about right now that has direct implication is what's happening in Ukraine and what it has to say about what we're doing here. In Ukraine, yes, there is danger of nuclear bombs and there is all this facing off and saber rattling and the rest. But the real danger comes from both Chernobyl and the nuclear reactors that are on the ground. The problem being that the nuclear industry and the Interatomic, International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, are all saying, well, you know, nuclear reactors are really robust. They, you don't have to worry about bombs going off there. What they don't talk about is that maybe the containment vessel is secure, but the cooling system is not. And all it takes is one errant missile hitting the intake for the cooling system, the cooling system goes out, you lose it, you're on diesel backup if it's even there, if you've got enough diesel, and when that goes out, you've got Fukushima. And that is potential right now in all six reactors at Zaporizhia, which has been taken over by Russia, and there are many other aspects too. The last four episodes of nuclear hot seat from uh, 558 through the current one and this one coming up are very focused on Ukraine, what's happening there and what it means and how to interpret it. I have engineers on, I have politicians, on, I have all kinds of aspects on it. And I encourage you to take a look at those. Here, the other thing is Chernobyl. You know, they say, oh, well, Chernobyl's got that huge dome over it. That is not hardened against missiles. And yes, Russia has taken it over. They have also, they trapped for, uh, I think it was a total of 29 days, the working crew there without any kind of conditions to support them. These are exhausted people trying to maintain a nuclear site. Is it an active, you know, reactor going off? No, but it is the waste it is all, everything that was that was gathered up to try and decommission the site and take care of the waste and put it in there. And all of that is under very sketchy control right now of the Russians. And they're holding on to it thinking that, well, Ukraine's not going to throw any missiles in there. Ukraine won't, but that doesn't mean that Russia won't. That they won't do a Hail Mary and blow the thing up just to be able to destroy we don't know what Russia is capable of. But what all of that is talking about is ultimately the danger of nuclear everywhere. And that includes right here, 60 miles down the coast, you've got San Onofre. What is San Onofre? Well, it's not an active nuclear reactor right now. But what you have on site are canisters that contain the nuclear waste, the spent fuel, plutonium loaded, the most deadly substance ever created on Earth. Plutonium will be deadly for 24,000 years times 10 cycles of, 24, of the 24,000 years. So we're talking about forever here. That is in canisters that are 100 feet from mean high tide of the Pacific Ocean, as it is now before we go further with you know, global heating and the ocean rise. It is in canisters that are only five eighths of an inch thin stainless steel. If you want to visualize that, if anybody here, anybody here have a MacBook Pro, seen a MacBook Pro? Slap it down, turn it this side, that's five eighths of an inch. That's all there is between all of this Chernobyl level waste and the outside environment. These are canisters that are only certified for 20 years even though they contain 24,000 years half-life plutonium. And they're known to corrode in a seawater environment. They've also been gouged in the way into the container vessels that they're in. There's a long story, I have lots of shows about that too. What we need to do is focus on not only no nukes, but turning this around, because that's a series of dirty bombs on the beach. And we need to have it framed that way because Edison is getting away with future murder down there. So here's what's been coming up behind the scenes in those of us who oppose nuclear. And that is the need to, please don't cringe, the, the need to engage with social media 
in a much more vigorous, focused way. Because the nuclear industry, they've got the world nuclear news, they've got millions upon millions of dollars that get put into manipulating the talking points, which is why in Britain they're saying, oh, well, we need small modular parentheses nuclear reactors in order to um uh, in order to fight climate change that's not the case in the eu they've already said in their green taxonomy the money that they are giving that's supposed to go to renewables more than half of it is going to nuclear because nuclear has sold the lie that somehow it works in this way and that's because of propaganda propaganda the unrelenting drumbeat so we don't have that kind of money, but what we do have are people and social media. So what is in the process of being organized right now? And this is a model that can be used for any movement, any one of us, and we can also use it with each other, is we are coming up with an editorial calendar for the coming year on a month by month basis of how to focus talking points. We are then going to be coming up with 10 talking points per month that anyone can post. I mean, you're free to build upon that and do more. But, you know, so that comes out to what? Two a week? You go on Twitter, you put it out. You go on Facebook, you put it out. What this does is it starts building our own echo chamber of talking points. And by doing this consistently, and not only on Facebook and not only on Twitter, God help me, a couple of weeks ago, I took a training on TikTok. I, don't know that I will ever do it, but I see the need for it. If anybody knows anybody under 40, preferably under 30, even under 20, uh, who would like to take this up, it would be great. We need to start infiltrating in our numbers, one at a time, one group at a time, our own talking points. And then there's another movement here that is represented. You want me to put your talking points out? Great, I'm on Twitter anyway, I'll post it. I'll post it on Facebook. And we can all do this for each other because we've got to start creating the noise from the grassroots up. So I have business cards with me for Nuclear Hot Seat. Again, it is nuclearhotseat.com. The new website just went up uh, last week and I have a genius in Thailand who's already boosted my numbers by 200% just by what he's doing with search engine optimization. We can all take advantage of this. It's a step we can all take and we must take doesn't cost anything, and it has the potential to be really effective. So thank you for this opportunity. Happy to talk with anyone available for podcasts and living room talks. Wow. Mimi, you're great. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got a couple more speakers. Elena is going to come up and speak for a, a couple of minutes. And then we have Myla Reason, who's organized this, and then John Brakey. Oh, and Peter, Peter Matthews and then John Brakey. Oh, okay, well then, Mimi, um, uh, well, d let's do Lena real quick, and then, uh, and then we'll, come on up. Oh, can you, you want to speak, speak from there? Oh, no, I, he can, oh, he, oh Leno, I, I did, I thought you were introducing somebody else. Um, my friend Magdalena, my friend Magdalena Rosavila came up from the border specifically for this and has to leave right away to get back to Tijuana. Leno and I have known each other a long time. Originally, he was an organizer in Colorado, me in California with the UFW, with Dolores and Cesar. He's, he's an amazing human being who, you live in Atlanta now, right? Yeah. And he also, he was involved with Amnesty International as I was. We've had similar paths. Um, he created, uh, co-founded Homies Unidos. So he's worked with gangs in El Salvador, in South Central, all over. Uh, he, he was a uh, he was a badass in Colorado, but uh, uh, Cesar and the farm workers kind of uh, he went through this conversion to nonviolence, and he's one of the most passionate, poetic, effective, and humorous yeah. advocates of organized nonviolence. It's my great pleasure, mi hermano Nleno Magdaleno Rosavila. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind
to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. I say that we take up arms. We arm ourselves with the truth, with compassion, and nonviolent. We cannot sit by and let people in our country and other countries tell us what they think the truth should be, what justice should be. You know, I was uh, in Tijuana the last three days working with immigrants there, and uh, I wanted to come up here and celebrate with you. And uh, I didn't realize it was going to take me seven hours. It is, uh, you can go through puberty trying to get through the border. I think I did it again twice. Uh, and I enjoyed it the second time. <laughs> um, but I want to say, um, can I ask Danny, are, are, uh, you're in Sarah's birthdays in April? What are they? April 6th and April 9th. April 6th and April 9th. Okay, write this down. April 6th and April 9th are birthdays. Who is April 10th? Dolores Huerta. It's Dolores Huerta. And who is the March 31st? Cesar Chavez. So from the 31st through the 10th, we're going to have 10 birthdays. Four birthdays, 10 days, I don't know. It's hard, Mexicans don't do math well. Um, especially after sitting at the border for so long. The, um, what we don't do enough in this, in our movements, is we don't celebrate. We're always working. So I'm saying, you know, I was trying to think is, what am I gonna send Dolores that she doesn't have? Uh, Danny, I can't send him any wisdom, he's got it all. Sarah's got the strategic thinking. But what I can do, and we can all do, to celebrate these four birthdays, is that we dedicate ourselves from the 6th, from March 31st through the 6th or the 10th of April. And we say that every day during that time, we're gonna call 10, 20 people and say, you gotta help us make California green. You gotta do that. That's a birthday present. And I want you, after you make your calls, to send the list in. Because sometimes you have to call people twice. You know, the thing we get worried about People say, no, I don't want to be a part of that. Well, you know, I was that way. I was not an environmentalist. I was just a worker, a farm worker. Cesar and Dolores made us environmentalists. I was not uh, against the war in Vietnam. It took people teaching me and bashing me in the head that I should be a peacemaker. I did not become nonviolent because uh, Jerry Falwell touched me on the forehead or someplace else. Uh, I became it because People took the time to talk to us. You know, the things, we see all these movies. I have a uh, niece who does the, the sets for the Marvel movies. I said, I don't need to watch the Marvel movies because I have three superheroes in our community. I have Sarah, I have Danny, and I have Dolores. Those are our superheroes. So I want somebody to make a film where Sarah, Dolores, puts their hand out, and out comes the truth, takes it into their mind and in their hearts, and they change. Yeah. You know, wouldn't that be great to see that? Those are our superheroes. And you're superheroes, because you came, and you listened, and you want to do something. Look, it's not easy to do change. We know that. When we worked for Cesar Chavez and Dolores, they paid us a great sum of $5 a day, a week. 10 for food. I was much thinner then. That's uh, Cesar and Dolores' diet plan for organizers. But let me tell you what, be not organizing, we don't recognize everybody who's in our community. Did you ever think about the story of uh, David and Goliath, right? And uh, David can sometimes win. But I thought about it for a while. I was organizing on, uh, against GMO, Monsanto, and Syngenta, and the Farm Bureau in Jackson County in 2014. And we got rid of all GMO seeds, all GMO plants, all GMO pesticides. And we did that by a family farms initiative. And I went there, and I, I can talk in public on occasion, but I was not a public speaker. I did not talk to the media. I went and organized workers. I stayed. We must all understand we don't need to be in front as long as we are doing our job. And I thought about David and Goliath, and I said, what if women, what if women at that day and age were writing the books? It'd probably be 
Diana defeats Goliath, right? Yes. Probably be that way. And we got to figure out what history books tell us. So right now, the fossil fuel industry, as you've heard more than once today, they're organized, they have the money, they have the lawyers, but we have David and Diana. And if we reach out and build that coalition, men, women, brown, black, white, Jewish, Muslim, whatever, that we can stop Goliath. It's gonna take work. It's gonna take work. And we gotta learn. We gotta learn how to say it, how to do it, and how to organize. And I'm, I'm dedicating time. I'm working my contacts in the Inland Empire where I used to live. Right now I live in Georgia. And you know, in Georgia, in Georgia in this last election, uh, I live in DeKalb County. You might've watched the results. We, we kicked booty in the general election and we kicked booty for the two new senators. And what did it take? We went out door knocking every day with NAACP, with, uh, there were people from Standing Rock calling in, unions calling in, everybody. It took everybody, but we did it. And we can do it on this one, but it's gotta take, you cannot say, well, Sarah and Danny, or maybe Carol or Tadak is gonna do it. We all have a responsibility. That's what happens. You know, Martin Luther King would remind us that it really doesn't matter how long you lived, but what you did when you were alive. And it really doesn't matter how powerful your friends were, how important they were, if you didn't use their presence to help you. So it really doesn't matter how long you live. You know, we'd all like to live a long life. Sanjivity, longevity has its place, but it's more important what you did when you were alive. And remember, it's not the promises you make, but the promises you keep. We're all making promises. Hey, Danny, I'll have lunch with you next week, or, you know, I'll uh, show up for the demonstration. We make promises that we don't keep. Sometimes we even go so far as to say, I'll love you forever. We make <laughs> promises we don't keep. But we must understand that we can change things, but we got to use every day of our lives to be a prophet for justice, a prophet for the environment. Mother Earth can't wait. The future can't wait. We got to, it's not just being on the right side of, of history, but it's in fact baking history. And that's what our Green Power Movement is doing in California. Viva! Viva! Thank you, Eno. Thank you, and thank you to Tonka for yeah. bringing him. We really appreciate it. We're now going to have um, a report from Arizona. And, and uh, uh, this guy here, we could not imagine uh, someone who's been more powerful and more effective. You saw the, the Michigas that came into Arizona when they tried to uh, rant and rave about uh, a stolen election. This is the man who turned it around. And John Brakey has shown how much incredible power a single individual uh, can have. And if you'll give us an update on your legislation in Arizona, then we're gonna have Myla and Peter and, um, and Ancor. Okay, so John, come on up. And uh, just welcome this guy, he's a true hero. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Harvey. Remember, we're still zooming. Yeah, we certainly are. We're still zooming. We're still out in there. All right. And it, they have canceled the uh, Oscars for this event. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm not going to talk too long or anything, but, uh, you know, I'm grateful to be here. And, I, and to end with what Harvey said, you know, I'm an activist. An activist acts. We make things happen. I'm very fortunate to be here with all of you because we get energy from each other as activists. And you know, as a young man, I heard something that I remembered all my life, and I tell people all the time what a great man John F. Kennedy was when he said that one person can make a difference and everybody should try. I live by that motto. I teach that. You know, I'm out here as an activist, you know, trying to get people to realize how to become a good activist. And I'm out here and I travel the country, do different, I've been in 18 states. And I tell people that uh, to learn the seven C's, character, capacity, credibility, civility, I can call you bad names real nicely with civility, <laughs> citizenship, country. But the most important one is to be courageous, to stand with your values, with facts and stand up. I had to do that when I decided to go ahead and get involved in the Arizona fraud. And it was a fraud is what it was. 
But you know, I know that letting these people just roam around and say all these things, and for us on the left just to ignore them is not a solution. You have to engage. And that's what I did. And it was very, very hard because, you know, I was called bamboo breaky. I was uh, mocked. I was death threatened. I was assaulted twice. And not one bit of that ever bothered me. Not one bit of it. But, you know, I'm not here to talk about that. What I'm here to talk about is what did we learn from the fraud? It? This is so important. We learned, me and a guy named Ken Bennett, and I want to tell you who Ken Bennett is. He was the president of the Arizona Senate for four years. He was secretary of state of my state for six years. And, you know, we found ourselves in the same foxhole. And what were we fighting? Grifters, parrot talkers, the best talkers and the worst producers. They don't go up in front of media. They do infra commercials and they lie and they lie. And they're very good at manipulating people who want to follow an authoritarian leader like Trump, which we don't. We follow for values. We go ahead for other things. But anyway, to get right to it, uh, me and this guy, Ken Bennett, got together and we wrote a bill. And, you know, we realized out of that audit, when we call it the Arizona miracle, that our country, and mainly our state right now, we are going to wind up with elections that are, one, transparent, two, trackable, three, publicly verified, and fourth, with a ballot library. The ballot library is how you store ballots. All ballots that come in through an envelope, after they're separated and made anonymous by disconnecting, and when it drops in the box, we want to marry that ballot to the ballot image. We want ballot images to be released publicly. Yes. Listen, the actual act of voting is the secret process. Counting is a public process. Yes. We have a black yes. box. I've been fighting that black box with Mimi Kennedy, a lot of other activists across this country. Uh, a black box is you don't know how it works inside. We want a system that when your ballot goes in the machine, it takes a picture of it, that picture becomes a public record. We want the ballot and the ballot image married to each other. If you get the images, you add up your own precinct, you should have the right to say, hey, I want to take a look at a couple of these images and I want to match them up against the original because I want to be absolutely sure. All right. Because democracy All depends right. upon it. And why? You know, how many people really realize that in 2020, that 80 million people did not vote in this country? Who could have? Yeah. 80 million. And you know, how many of those millions have jo joined the Mark Twain party? That's the party that believes if voting made a difference, we wouldn't let you do it. <laughs> we have to change that. You know, right now, 50 million Americans believe that Trump had his election stolen. Not true. We proved that in Arizona. Okay? We wound up with 360 more, four more votes for Biden than Trump. Even though the people who were counting lost count, I watched them hand count them. I watched them take pictures of them. I watched them weigh the ballots. Okay? And then bought a separate machine just to count them again. Do I believe they found 364? Yeah, I guess I do. But I know that they lost control because they were idiots. The guy who ran this thing, uh, this audit, he was from uh, Florida. And before he came over, somebody paid off his house for $400,000. Wow. He has 12 kids and he's 40 some years old. So you can tell he's probably a wing nut, which he was, okay? He made a movie and he tried to hide in the movie. And guess what his name was? Anon, like QAnon, okay? You know, it's just really something else. But anyway, we have a bill called 2780 that me and Ken Bennett wrote. I got documents here. Uh, it has two different methods in it because, you know, in Maricopa County, they said they had an 80% turnout and our voter database was 2.6 million voters. We are the second largest county in the United States when it comes to elections. It wasn't 2.6 million people who could possibly vote. It was 2.85 million because they, like, they hid 285,000 people because they're getting ready to be pushed off the list. It's called the inactive list, but they show up. So what does that do? It causes big conspiracies. All of a sudden we have precincts that have 100% turnout. 
How'd that happen? It's impossible, they say. Then if you look at all these ghost voters, they claim there was 93,000 ghost voters. Those ghost voters came off the inactive list. We're demanding that before an election, 10 days, they're gonna to have to release everybody who can vote, and then another list of who voted, not all your information, just your name and your address. If you're a voter who's a judge, well, we'll just put a blank there or whatever. But we're trying to take conspiracies off the table and use facts. So anyway, uh, we think we got a really great chance, and we're hoping that if this bill passes, and it's not all the way there, but it's already passed the House, it's already in the Senate, it's already passed one committee, two more, it goes to the governor's desk to be signed, it looks good. Believe it or not, me getting involved with those Republicans, this is unbelievable. I didn't get one vote from the Democratic Party in the House. 31 votes came from Republicans. Right now, the Senate has 16 Republicans and 14 Democrats. I know that I have the 16 votes. Now I'm working with Mimi and progressive uh, America, Democrats of America because what I really need is this thing to pass with really big partisan numbers. A lot of Democrats, a lot of Republicans because what we are doing is that we went from a fraud it and now we're proposing the Arizona miracle that we never have to do a $9 million audit again paid by Republicans, by the way. Uh, they only hustle 400 million nationally, okay? It's a grifter movement. It's awful to see what's happening. A lot of these grifters are like dope dealers. You take them off the corner, they bring another one right in, okay? It's just incredible. But if we pass this, uh, we hope to be able to launch it nationally because our country deserves elections that are transparent, trackable, publicly verified. In fact, elections are no good unless they're transparent, trackable, and publicly right. verified. Let's get those 80 million people back in. And you know, in closing, I just want to say one other thing, is that it's really great to be here with a lot of great people. You can feel the energy of activism to be here with Danny Sheehan, Mimi, uh, Joel, and Harvey, and everybody here. It's a great thing. And you know, I'm a very stressed person by my work, okay? Because the responsibility, and sometimes I have to make decisions. And I want you to know on my wall in my house, you know, when I get really stressed, I meditate. And I use the Lakota prayer. And I just want to end with that Lakota prayer. Great mystery, teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intuition, my inner knowing, the sense of my body, the blessing of my spirit. Teach me to trust these things so that I may enter my sacred space and love beyond my fear. Wow, those are big words, aren't they? Loving beyond our fear. And thus walk in the balance with the passing of each glorious sun. I am glad to be here today and be with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank you. I don't know about that. Just one person. Beautiful, John. Wow. This is a guy who's really made a tangible difference in the world. This is about as great a crowd as you could ever hope for at any event. I mean, the quality uh, is fantastic. And we owe the whole event to Myla Reeson here. Myla has done all the logistics. As they say, the tables and chairs and, and all the food and just she's and she's also a truly great activist. Maya, come on up. He's a, this is a very humble man here. Um, if, if it hadn't been for Harvey's inspiration, I wouldn't have had to work so hard for the past few years. Um, I want... Uh, uh, Lucy Fernandez, Hernandez, and Rosa Lopez, Woo! and Lynn Harvey, all to come oh, up. Yeah. Um, come on up, come all on three on. of you, please, come up. And, um, it's Rosa's come up. birthday. It's Rosa's Happy birthday. birthday. And she's working on her birthday. Come on up, you know, this is my good friend, Rosa. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And I want to thank my my uh, good friend John Hayes for coming Woo! and agreeing to do the streaming, which turned out to be recording, and my friend Charles Andrews, and Fredericks.
I always get that wrong. Always. I've been getting it wrong for years. And um, everybody for being here. This is such a very inspirational event. I work with the farm workers Amen. as a volunteer in 1965 and 66. I was in Delano Thank you. with Thank Cesar you. And, you. and Dolores. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At any rate, um, you know, I've been an activist for my life, my whole life, I guess, and um, I've worked on, on many, many issues. And it's, uh, it's kind of, it's inspiration. There have been so many wonderful speakers. I feel uh, <laughs> humble here as one, but uh, I, what I'd like to, I guess I can talk about two things. One of the campaigns that I've been working on is that um, the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power three months after the meltdown at Three Mile Island, where uh, Lily Hale Libby Halepe happened to be, the city of Los Angeles decided to throw in to finance the largest nuclear power plant in the United States. If it had not been for the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Palo Verde nuclear power plant in Arizona would never have been built. It is the largest nuclear power plant in the United States. It is the only nuclear power plant in the United States that is not situated by a body of water, not by a river, not by an ocean, not by a lake, because water is essential to keep re atomic reactors from melting down. So what do they use? They use repurposed municipal wastewater that is aggregated from the entire state of Arizona. And they evaporate 27,000 gallons of water every minute of every day to keep those three enormous reactors from melting down. And this is in the desert. This is in a, in a state where the aquifer is almost entirely depleted. But the water comes from the Colorado River and then is used in municipalities throughout the state of Arizona. And the city of Los Angeles is an owner in that nuclear power plant. The, the power from the nuclear power, I mean the, the nuclear, sorry, the Palo Verde nuclear power plant travels by transmission lines from Arizona to Southern California to various places in Southern California at least half of that electricity is lost in transmission. So one of the projects that I'm hoping that will at least be on your radar is that the city of Los Angeles has to divest. Yeah. It has to divest from the Palo Verde nuclear power plant. And you know, there's a lot more that I can talk about, but it's late and I'm amazed that you all have stayed as long as you have. So I'm gonna cut it off at this point. And, uh, <laughs> Where can we and find out what, what where can we well that's a good question uh, because I don't have a website about it I'm sorry Char Charles Charles right to, right pa Palo Verde it means in Spanish Palo is stick and Verde is green so it literally means green stick and it has to do with a kind of plant which is called Palo Verde it's the Palo Verde nuclear power plant and I want you to um, when uh, when people are running for office for city office in, in los angeles city councilors people who are running for mayor ask them about divesting from palo verde thank, thank you. you very much fantastic marla thank you so much sure come come sarah then we're going to have um uh anchor and then peter okay and then uh, joel siegel is going to wrap us up He's gonna. Joe Siegel is gonna circumcise the event. So, okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say uh, something exciting. The National Organization for Women is going is endorsing the bill, and, and so is the uh, PDA. So right. this is really exciting. If anyone uh, is interested in their organization uh, endorsing, I have some material here. I'd be happy to give it to you. How to find the bill? See all the things and endorse right online. Yes. Hey, thank you. That's fantastic. Anchor Patel, come on up, and then Peter Matthews. 
And if you, you want a minute, come on up. Anchorman for Congress, and then Peter Matthews will come up. And then Joel Siegel is going to wrap us up. It's been a phenomenal event, my God. Uh, so come on down, and here we go. You are not alone. You are not alone in taking in this energy and appreciating the, the atmosphere and the ambiance. You are not alone. You are not alone in the struggle. You are not alone as an activist. You are not alone in having too many commitments spread thin and, and things falling through your fingers, showing up late. You are not alone. We are not alone. We got a movement. So which side are you on? Are you on the side of war in the military industrial complex? No. Or are you on the side of peace? Yeah. Are you on the side of the oil companies and the polluters that are destroying our planet for short-term profit? No. Or are you on the side of clean water and clean air and clean energy for our seven generations into the future? Yes. Are you on the side of the pharmaceutical companies and the hospital industrial complex or whatever you want to call it that are killing people and making profit? No. Or are you on the side of universal single health care for all? Yes. Yeah. Now is the time. Now is the time to find a candidate to support and go all in. Now is the time to put your boots on the ground. Now is the time to show up. Now is the time. That is my time. Fantastic. Peter, come on up. And then Joel Siegel is going to wrap us up. He's got a great special guest here. Speaking of a candidate. Thank you, folks, for sticking around. Peter Matthews, I'm running for Congress in the 42nd District in Long Beach and Southeast LA. I like to quote Frederick Douglass. He said, We're there. He said, Power concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Now, we've all been demanding for a long time, am I right? The corporate sponsored politicians give us clean air, give us a Green New Deal. We want to provide universal health care, Medicare for all. We want them to pr provide tuition free college from preschool to university medical school. We've been demanding a long time. What has happened? Most of them have been bought and paid for by the corporate lobbyists, yeah. and they don't respond to us. Yeah. Isn't it time that we get our own people elected without corporate money? I'm one of them. I'm a progressive Democrat of America with you all the way, with no corporate money. I rely on your support in order to make this happen. So, you know, I have, I have, if you look at 20% of our children go to bed hungry sometime during the month. In this wealthy country in the world, 20% of our children go to bed hungry sometime during the month. Let that sink in. 43% of American families cannot even afford a small $400 repair bill for their car. 40% are living at the poverty level or below. This is not right. It's not justice. It's not fair. It's not spiritual accomplishment. It's not the American dream. The book I wrote was Dollar Democracy on Steroids. With liberty and justice for some, how to reclaim the middle class, middle class dream for all. Because it belongs to everyone in the world, not just here. I'm an internationalist who believes American your nation should be one of justice and peace and harmony and we go out around the world we should support the people that are struggling for justice not the military industrial complex not to sell more weapons and wars my last chapter is waste fraud and abuse in the military industrial congressional complex which president eisenhower first labeled it by the way eisenhower first in his draft speech he said military industrial congressional complex his brother said mr president why do you take out congressional he said, my God, I'm already taking on the military and the corporations. You want me to take out Congress also right now? Let me do one thing at a time, or two things at a time. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with that. It's a long time. It's been a long day. Please go to PeterMagnusForCongress.org. I'd love to have your support. PDA and everyone else here, I love all the progressives here. Take care while I'm with you. God bless you. Send that man to Congress. Okay, we have a really quick surprise visitor, and then, Pete, then Joel's going to wrap us up. Wendy, how? Sure. Come on up. Wendy is from Tim Robbins' Actors Gang down in Culver City, a real something you really got to see. Lindy, so great to have you with us. Go. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Joel. Uh, I, I wish I could have got here earlier. We did a matinee out in Culver City. I don't know if you guys have heard of our little theater company called The Actors Gang, but... Um, oh, yeah. 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 Dang. We're doing a play right now just about corporate greed, and uh, it's called Can't Pay, Don't Pay, and it's about these women who decide to just take everything from the grocery store for free because they're tired of paying expensive prices for the groceries. So it's really funny and it's a lot of fun, but I, I just am so happy to be here and just hear everybody speak. I wish I could have been here earlier to hear everybody's voices. And I just think all of us coming together with art, theater, politics, like we just have to all unite it all together and be there as one. So I'm so honored to be here and um, thank you guys so, so much. Thanks, Joel. Hey, welcome. Thank you. 
Okay, we're at the end here. What a great group, what a great event. Jan and Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. This is such a high quality group of people. Couldn't be better. Thank you, Eileen, for all your great work uh, and all you speakers. Uh, and uh, and then how fabulous that you came. Uh, so many people, Danny, Danny and Sarah and Tatanka and all, all of you. Uh, Joel, you want to well, say a, a closing uh, bracha here? <laughs> you, mu you must be Jewish, dude. No. <laughs> I don't know. I broke my arm. I don't know who well, did. I was born a Jew, but uh, I was born a Jew. But when it comes to religion, I'm just kind of Jew-ish. So. <laughs> well, no, you're a, you're Jewish and Buddhist, which makes you a Boo Jew, which is what I'm. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, <laughs> I met Lindy. I was actually going to meet Harvey for the first time, and I'm on the plane, and Lindy was there. And she started showing me a board. Was this impeach Trump board uh, thing? It was, it was called Disgrace to the White House. <laughs> so I didn't know she worked for Tim Robbins, you know. And uh, we just started hanging out and got to know each other. But just, you know, thank you so much for coming. Uh, yeah. Um, so what, just three things. One, what, what about if we do this once a year? Yay! Yes! Sure. Yeah. On Oscar Day. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, what happens... We got like some of the greatest organizers in the nation and the history of the country, like right here. Everybody's sort of humble and cool, but we got like Tatanka Brook. He's a freaking legend, man. He's a legend. Tatanka, yeah. You know, you know, John Brakey, literally one of the founders of election protection. We got, um, you know, people, huh? Men. I mean, there's just like all this, you know, incredible energy, but we should do it once a year. One thing Congressman Connie used to always say is, Hey man, Siegel, let's do a follow-up action. Follow up and let's just do this once a year. So amen, are we cool? Amen. Yeah. Right. Number two, this is really exciting. This is why grief is so important. We're talking about doing a concert on climate change in Los Angeles uh, in support of the Green Initiative and stopping climate change before it's too late globally too. What do you think of the idea of a concert? Yeah. Oh, wait a second, I forgot. Didn't you do the No Nukes concert? That was a while ago. And didn't I do the thing with Bono? Yeah, thing with Bono? If the globe lights, let's do it again. Um, so, so I work. How many people here think everyone should have housing as a human right? Yes. So, this campaign that we've launched is the National Coalition for the Homeless out of Washington D.C. I'm the director of the campaign. It's called Bring America Home Now campaign. So, we're going to be introducing some of the most progressive federal legislation, you know, ever to end homelessness. And I'm just gonna tell you why I'm working on it and then I'm gonna get off the stage here. We can go eat, what are you having, pizzas or something? Yeah, well, there's food. <laughs> well, there was food, I don't know, I haven't checked. Homemade matzo ball soup? All right, so, um, so when I used to run homeless, first of all, when I was 30, I, came, I was the director of the Chinese democracy movement right out of law school, got really lucky. And um, I got had major surgery for sleep apnea and I, I couldn't work. So I came home and all my stuff was, I got evicted, all my stuff was on the street. So, so I was homeless for four years uh, because my mo I, I don't have a father, he died when I was a kid, my mother's very poor. So um, I was homeless, for, I mean. Tough night, you Oh well, yeah. Um, so I'm lucky because I had people who, you know, helped me out. Well, what if you don't have that help? You end up in what, a homeless shelter? So I ran homeless shelters for many years and they're, uh, minimum security prisons. Nobody should even be, right? Yeah. Nobody yeah. should even be in a shelter. You don't, you know, I love dogs and everything, right? But you, know, you could put a dog in a shelter, they might survive, but not, you don't put a human being in there. But I ran a shelter where there'd be 120 black men, 30 degree weather outside, and I noticed they were coming in with hard hats and tools. I'm like, this guy told, this priest told me that these people were, you know, incorrigible. And he was lying to me. But they would, uh, clutch Bibles to their chest and I heard them crying at night. And then I've run homeless shelters and I've worked with this population and a lot of the women who were teenagers get assaulted in shelters. Don't you think people should have an apartment, not a shelter? So the campaign is to end homelessness once and for all. And if you go to nationalcoalitionforthehomeless.org, uh, if you want to be a part of the campaign, but we're going to launch in Los Angeles with Susie Shannon. All right. Yay! But I think the I think the epicenter of the movement it could be Atlanta. I know you're saying, oh, Joel's in the corner. Um, or Los Angeles. And I'll be coming out here again 
because we're going to end it. And it's not, it's, it's a very difficult campaign because people are making money off, I call them poverty pimps. Yes. They're making money. Yes, they are. They're making money off these shelters and uh, because they're not in a shelter, they're in the suburbs somewhere. All right. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say is we're going to end homelessness. I'm honored to be here. I want to thank Eileen. Hey, Eileen, man. You. That's right. And but I, I want to thank this guy right here. Yeah, I do. Um, thank you, thank you. Oh, Mr. Modest, come on. Um, he's my brother, man. But um, this grassroots election protection coalition is keeping us all together, progressives. We got to get out of these silos. We got to get Peter. We got to get you in the Congress, man. But thanks for coming out. Thanks for your contributions. But we're going to be working on climate change as well as election protection. And right? homelessness. No nukes, everybody. Thank you. Aho. Oh, Couldn't have been better. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. We'll Hello. see each other again. And, uh, hey, John. And, and Joel, you, you get Joel. the Oscar. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Baloney. What?